hit go live. Let's okay. see what happens. It's it's connecting live. And I hope it should work pretty well. Okay, so it's working live. And we are live on YouTube now, my friends. Welcome to our meetup. So let me just quickly share my screen and uh, let me just fire up this presentation now. And uh, we can then start our meetup with our amazing and lovely guest today over here who is joining all the way from London. Hi, David. Nice to see you here. And let me share my screen. There we go, share and share the next doctor. Perfect. Wow. So let's begin the show. Welcome to Microsoft Excel Power Platform Meet of Saudi Arabia. It's my pleasure, my friends, to welcome all of you. And as usual, you know that we run this meetup in Saudi Arabia team and all the people joining from globally over here. And today we have a very special guest, which I'll shortly introduce to you. Um, and uh, But just like always, uh, if you don't know me, I, I'm pretty sure by now you know me, all of you know me. But I'm Faraz Sheikh. I'm founder of ExcelExciting.com. I'm an MVP, uh, I'm an MCT, MIE, Microsoft Innovative Educator. I'm an Office Master Certified, uh, a YouTuber, blogger, and I run Meetup for Saudi Arabia. And my passion is always with my friends, you know, to share and gain the knowledge and help people, uh, help the community and uh, give them the easy solution for with using the Office application. So that's my passion with my friends. So, as I said that, uh, you, you can see that we have some of our great speakers past meetups, uh, which has been held over here in 2022. And uh, you can definitely scan this QR code and that will uh, take you to the playlist and you can always find this YouTube recordings, uh, this meetup recordings on YouTube in the playlist of Saudi Arabia uh, Power Platform Meetup. So feel free to check out that. Having said that, we are going to have our next speaker, Ms. Pragiti Jain, who will be uh, talking about how to learn to visualize DAX tricks. And Pragati is also based in the UK. And today's speaker is also there. He's also from UK. So wow, we are getting back to back. Uh, my friends coming from UK and joining this meetup. So Prakriti will be talking about DAX tricks. She'll be core talking about Power BI and some amazing DAX tricks. And I'm really excited and looking forward uh, what DAX tricks she will be having. So from this community, I would uh, encourage everyone to um, come forward. And if you have any knowledge, you'd like to share it with the community, please write me back on uh, my email address and we can connect and uh, come and share your power skills, superhero skills, so that we can uh, take the advantage and we can learn together and help the community together. And most of you must be knowing about this quick housekeeping, you know, just try to keep your mic mute. And in case if you have any connectivity issue, you can rejoin. And uh, definitely if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand and always feel free to use the chat box. You can just mention it Q before your question and uh, so that it can be easy for the presenter to find your question. And note that my friends, that this session is uh, live streaming and recorded and will be available on youtube.com uh, slash Excel exciting channel. So we have our guest today on the hot seat, Mr. Mike, Mike Thomas. Uh, he's a Microsoft trainer and uh, he is going to talk about Q functions where the worksheet meets the data model. So it would be really interesting to see from Mike, you know, a Q function is really, you know, people are always scared to use, but I have seen Mike, you know, explaining uh, in some other meetups in Toronto as well. Uh, explaining about few functions and uh, those was pretty amazing. So I, I would leave the floor to Mike. Mike, feel free to introduce yourself and uh, 
And the stage is all yours. Great. Thanks, uh, Faraz. I'll just share my screen. There we go. Um, okay, great. So hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Thomas. Yeah, I don't know why I was on mute there. Okay, let me start again. Um, my name is Mike Thomas. Uh, I'm an IT trainer, been an IT trainer for 30 odd years. I currently work at AstraZeneca in the UK, uh, working in their global IT training team. And uh, my focus is on office and collaboration tools. But my first love is Excel and Power BI. Uh, as well as delivering training courses, you will also find me on YouTube, uh, creating videos. And my blog is the Excel Trainer. .co.uk, where I, uh, I blog and write tutorials there. I will come back to cube functions in a minute. Um, I'm going to make this a, a you know an informal session, as I'm, I'm, I'm sure most uh, most meetup sessions are. Um, you know, I've attended quite a few meetup sessions. Uh, this is the first one that I've done for for the Saudi Arabia group. So uh, I'd like to say thank you to Faraz for uh, for asking me to come along and speak. Um, I've attended quite a few uh, of the London meetup uh, sessions and the um, the Toronto meetup sessions, and I've also attended um, the last two. Um, global summits. I'm, uh, I'm down to speak on th uh, this year's summit, uh, next year's summit. So looking forward to that in February. Uh, so please, yeah, ask any questions as we go through the session. Um, to understand cube functions, and I will explain what cube functions are as we go, but to understand cube functions, you need to know about two things. You need to know about the data model and you need to know about DAX measures. Now, it could be that everybody who is here today knows about the data model and knows about measures, but it could also be that you don't. So I am going to start by explaining about the data model and about measures. Uh, if you do already know about those, uh, then just bear with me. But, you know, I know what it's like coming along to one of these sessions, wanting to learn and, and, and not actually knowing about the basics, as it were, for the particular topic. So I will start by running through those. So I'm going to I'm going to actually come out of this presentation and I'm going to go into this file here. I'm happy to make these files available, uh, by the way, later. Um, you can either mail me directly or I can uh, can send them to for us and he can he can forward them on. So this isn't a, a session about the data model and it's not a deep dive on DAX. All I'm saying is you need to be aware of what the data model is and what uh, DAX is and how to create uh, a simple DAX, DAX measure. So I have some data in this file. I have basically a, a table of data in this file. It's, it's made up sales data for a company that makes and sells ice cream. But where is that data? It's not in the spreadsheet. It's not in this other sheet here. There's no hidden sheets. So where is it? Well, the data is in the data model. What the data model is, is a place inside an Excel file that's used to store tabular data instead of storing the data in the spreadsheet cells, which is traditionally where you've stored tabular data. Now, why would you store data in the data model instead of the spreadsheet? Well, that's that's a whole discussion in its own right, which I'm not going to go into today. But I would say that there are more benefits of storing the data in the data model than there are storing the data in the spreadsheet. So how do you get to see the data? Well, first of all, how do you add the data into the data model? There's a number of ways. You can go through data, get data. That's the usual way. And there's a tick box when you go through that process that says add the data to the data model. There are other ways, but that's the usual way. Um, but once you've got the data in the data model, if you go to the data menu and you go to manage data model, 
or you can go to the power pivot menu and click on manage. It doesn't matter which way you do it. That will open up the data model window. If you have any questions, by the way, about what I've just said, feel free to ask, put them into the into the chat in uh, in, in Zoom. Um, because as I said, I appreciate different people are at different stages along their Excel learning journey. Some people may be really familiar what the data model is and just taking the opportunity to have a, a quick snooze whilst I explain it. Other people may have never heard of it or used it. But there's the data. So I have got 1000 rows of made up sales data sitting in the data model of this file. And basically it's information about orders. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to close the data model down. What I want to do is I want to know what the total revenue is. And I want to know how many orders there are. And I want to know how much money came from selling premium flavors. If I just go back into the data model, every one of those sales has a, has a product type and it can either be standard or premium. And basically it depends on the product. So I think from memory, yeah, there we go. If it's chocolate ice cream, it's premium. And if it's, uh, I think it's toffee, it's also premium. Yeah, chocolate and toffee are premium flavors. Everything else is standard flavor. So I want to know how much revenue we generated from selling um, premium flavored ice cream. And also I want to know how much uh, money we generated from selling premium flavored ice cream to customers based in the UK. Now, one way to do this is to create a pivot table. So I've already done that just to save a bit of time. I've created a very simple pivot table. Uh, and if you've never created a pivot table from the, uh, the data model, you can go to insert pivot table from data model. And then you can just create the pivot table wherever you want it, but it knows that data is coming from the data model instead of the data coming from the spreadsheet. And then to build the pivot table, you just do it in the normal way. So there's my total revenue. I've just dragged in revenue and dropped that into, into values, the average days to pay and the number of orders. Then all I have to do is do a formula, say in B4, which references that cell there and I've got my total revenue. So that is one way to do it. Put the data in the data model, uh, then uh, create a pivot table from the data model, and then use formulas, just standard formulas, to reference the cells in the data model. Okay, nothing wrong with doing it that way, but creating a pivot table adds extra work and also requires refreshing every time more data gets added to the data model. An alternative way you is to use cube functions. Basically, a cube function uses a measure as one of its parameters. So what a cube function is, there's a few of them. It's just a normal Excel formula or function whose name begins with cube. And there's seven or eight of them there. I won't be going through all of them. I'll be going through three or four of them, which are the most useful ones. So they are normal Excel functions that you type into a cell but they pull data from the data model. And that's, you know, that, that's basically why I call this session where the spreadsheet meets the data model. So the first thing you need to do is you need to create measures. If you've never used measures, if you've never heard of measures, measures are special formulas written in DAX, which is the, uh, the data uh, analysis expression language that is used within the data model. So measures are used to perform calculations on the data that's in the data model. For this report, I need two measures. You might think I need more than two measures. You might think I need four measures, one measure for each cube function, which will go in here. But actually, I don't. As, as you'll see shortly, I actually need only need to create a couple of measures. One measure is going to store the total revenue. And the other measure is going to store the number of orders. OK, I don't see any questions so far. 
just having a quick look at the chat. So to create a measure, go to the Power Pivot tab on the ribbon, click on Measures and select New Measure. I want to store the measure in the Sales YTD table. I didn't actually mention that if I go into the data model, we can see that the data is stored in a table called Sales YTD, Sales Year to Date. So I'll do that again, Power Pivot, Measures, New Measure. I need to give the measure a name. You can call the measure anything you like, but I always try and give my measures sensible, meaningful, logical names. So I'm going to call this one Total Revenue. You can put the description, but I'm going to leave it blank. And then you enter the formula. Now, here's a little tip for you. If you hold the control key down, if you've got, first of all, if you've got a mouse with a wheel on it, if you hold the control key down and scroll the wheel away from you, it zooms in. If you scroll the wheel towards you, it zooms out. So it means that I can see what I'm typing and more importantly, you can see what you're typing. So hold the control key down and zoom in and zoom out. OK, so this measure is simply going to generate the total revenue. So just like in normal spreadsheet uh, functions, there are a lot of functions that Microsoft have ported across from the spreadsheet side of Excel into DAX and sum is one of them. So equal sum open brackets. And then if I scroll down the list, I can either choose revenue or I can use sales YTD revenue. It's always preferable to use the one that's preceded by the name of the uh, of the uh, table. You can just use that one, but you know if you had more than one table in your data model in uh, in in Power Pivot, and they both contained a revenue column, Excel might get a little bit confused. So I always, and it's it's recommended by, by everybody, uh, that you use the, the one with the table name. So double click on that and close your brackets. Okay, so there we go. There is our, uh, our formula. So it's just adding up all the figures in there. Click OK. Now, you can't actually see the value of the measure in the spreadsheet, but if you go back into the data model, you can do in this area at the bottom. It's called the calculation area. You've got to make sure it's visible. I think it is by default, but there's a button up there on the ribbon that allows you to hide and show it. So as long as the calculation area is visible, there is the measure and the current value of it. If I created another measure, it would be displayed there, its name and its value. So I'm going to create another measure. This measure is going to count the number of orders. Now, there's a couple of ways I could do this. So first of all, I'll just go through Power Pivot Measures New Measure, and I will call this one Number of Orders. One way I could do it would be to use the good old count or count a function and just pick one of the columns. So, for example, um, revenue. <clears throat> because we know that back in the data model, every single row has a value in the revenue column. So, um, you know, if I told it to count the number of revenues, that would come to a thousand. If I told it to count the number of products, that would come to a thousand. If I told it to count the number of order IDs, that would come to a thousand. Because what you're doing is you're saying count the number of values in that column. So as long as there are no blanks in that column, that will work. But there's another and I think better way of doing it rather than doing it that way, because doing it that way, every time you open this file, what Excel has to do behind the scenes is it has to actually count the number of items in whichever column you've chosen. So because I'd chosen revenue, it actually has to go one, two, three, four, and so on. Whereas if I use a different function, which is the count rows function, it's a DAX function, uh, which doesn't appear in Excel itself, 
though there is the rows function, which is very, very similar, it knows that there are a thousand rows in this table. It assigns the value a thousand to that measure and it keeps that value in memory. So it doesn't need to recalculate it unless you refresh the data. It doesn't need to recalculate it and actually count the number of values every time. So it's a lot more efficient. Um, I think I did a YouTube video on it not long ago. Um, count versus count A versus count rows. Uh, but anyway, if I go back to new measure and call this measure, as I say, number of orders. And I will use count rows, open brackets, and the name of the table, which was sales year to date. So I don't need a particular column in there. I just need to reference the table and click OK. And again, if I switch back into the data model, you can see now there we go. We need to scroll up a bit. You can see now that we've got the two measures that I've created along with their current values. OK, I will be creating more measures shortly, but for the moment, what I now need to do is I need to pull through the value of the uh, measure that I created called total revenue and display it in that cell. And this is where cube value comes in. So equals cube value. There we go, equals cube value. So it's just one of the six or seven cube functions. Equals cube value. What the cube value does is it grabs the value of a measure. Now, the cube value function has a minimum of two parameters. The first parameter is the connection. And the good news is it's always the same. It's this workbook data model, which goes in double quotes, so much so that when you type in a double quote, IntelliSense pops up and I can just double click on that. This workbook data model, close double quotes. That will always be the same. Then a comma and then the member expression one is actually the name of the measure. And the way you write that, again, is in double quotes. Double click on measures or tab on measures to save you typing it, dot, and then it lists the names of all the measures. So there is one of the measures I created. There is the other measure. The other entries in this list have been automatically generated. I think what it's doing is it's looking at um, columns in the data model that are numeric and it's providing me with a sum um, of those an average of that I don't know why we've not got um, uh, average oh we have we have we've got some sum of revenue I don't know why we've not got average of revenue uh, but yeah that's what it's doing it's looking at the data model it's looking at the columns that have got numbers in and it's automatically created some uh, some measures which is quite handy saves you doing it um but yeah the one i want is the measure called total revenue so i'll just double click it close the brackets close the quotes close the brackets so that is the uh, that's the structure of the of the function it's always this workbook data model in double quotes comma and then uh, measures dot and the measure name there we go. There is the value. Now, if I wanted to display that in, in currency, say UK pounds, then I've got a couple of options. One option is obviously go and, go and format the cell directly. But the other option is going back to the measures. This time I'll do manage measures, highlight that measure and edit it. And you can actually apply formatting as part of the measure. So I could choose currency. I get all the currency symbols. I'll just go for UK pounds because it's the default on my machine. Uh, let's have no decimal places. Click OK and close that. And there we go. So you can you can actually generate the uh, the formatting as part of the measure. OK, next thing then I will do is a second measure, this time number of orders. 
So equals Q value, can't spell it. There we go, equals Q value, open brackets, double quotes, this workbook data model, closed for quotes, then a comma, and then I want open double quotes, measures, dot, and this one will be number of orders. It's just a case of remembering all the double quotes. And that gives us a thousand. If you did a refresh, so if you if you added more data to the original data source and then did a refresh, the data and the data model would update and then uh, the uh, values of the measures would update and that would update these as well. OK, the next one I want to do is calculate the revenue just from a premium. Before I do, does do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Just put any questions or comments in the no, chat. There are no questions so far. OK, excellent. <coughs> OK, so um, what I want to do here, as I said, is I want to calculate the revenue from sales of premium um, flavours of ice cream. And just to remind you, we've got the word is basically where the word premium appears in this product type column. Now, there's a couple of ways to do that. One way would be to go and create another measure use the calculate function uh, in the measure to uh, get the total revenue only where product type equals premium. But I don't have to do that because I can actually include the criteria in the cube value function. So I can put equals cube value, then this workbook data model, and then it's going to be measures, so total revenue, that's the name of the measure, comma, and it's going to be open quotes, sales YTD, which is the name of the table this time, dot product type, equals no it's not equals sorry it's dot and this is where the fun starts open quotes ampersand open quotes again premium close quotes make sure i've got that right i think i have here yeah. We'll soon find out if there's an error. No, there we go. That is right. Uh, I'm going to assume that the value is correct. I know the value is correct because I actually took the data into Excel and and, and just uh, added it up uh, just to check it was correct. But yeah, um, there is the uh, there is the val there is the uh, the formula. So I will talk through that because it was a little bit more complex than the ones we've done. Uh, so I'll go through that. So yeah, cube value, this workbook data model, that's the connection. The first parameter is what we are wanting to pull in. And then the second parameter is treated as the criteria. So the criteria, that was the closing quote from that. And that was the opening quote. And that was the closing quote, and then an ampersand, and then opening quote. There doesn't need to be a space there, it's still calculated it. Okay, so just make sure you get all the quotes correct. It's like building up a string, like a concatenate uh, function. All right, so if everyone's okay with that, I will move on and show you another one and get a little bit more adventurous with uh, two criteria. So My again, question, would you like to take it? Uh, the question is uh, from the YouTube. It says that uh, is uh, cube functions as case, uh, is it sensitive, case sensitive? 
Uh, interestingly, the uh, the measure name is case sensitive, and I've only found that out today when I was testing something. Um, well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. This will interest you for us. It's case sensitive on the Mac, and it's not case sensitive on Windows. Uh, so yeah, I would I would say um, yes and no is the answer to that. Um, I was I was actually testing this out on the Mac earlier because uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have spotted I'm using a Mac uh, and I'm running it on Parallels, so I'm running this on Windows because although you can open um, files on the Mac that have the data stored in the data model, you can't access the data model because Excel for the Mac doesn't support power pivot. So you can't create measures and you can't access the data model if you're using Excel for the Mac. So what I did is I created the measures and I imported the data into the data model on Windows. Then I took the file across to the Mac and then I created the cube function on the Mac just to see if it would work. Because uh, I thought we might get a question today, maybe from Faraz, maybe from somebody else. <laughs> um, and interestingly, I found that if you put the measure name in, if you if you it basically it is case sensitive on the on the Mac, but not on Windows. So cube function itself isn't case sensitive, although the measure names appear to be case sensitive on the Mac. OK. Um, OK, why do I enter the word premium at the end of the formula? Because that second parameter is being treated as criteria mark. OK, so the first parameter is the, um, the connection, and it's always this workbook data model. The second parameter is what you are trying to pull through. And the third parameter is criteria. So it's basically, it's like, think of it as like a SQL statement, if you're familiar with that. So we're saying where product type from the sales YTD table equals premium, but you don't use the word equals. You actually use a dot. The way you write it, um, is, is is like, uh, well, you can see how you write it there. It uses the dot, dot notation. So it's table name, dot, I suppose it's a bit like VBA in a way, although, of course, VBA uses equals, but it's um, table name, dot, column name, dot, value. So I hope that makes sense to you. Um, and then I just use the ampersand to concatenate it. So if I change that to standard, then that is the uh, the revenue from standard. You're welcome, welcome, Mark. Um, so yeah, if I if I go and add in a second um, example with a parameter, what I'm going to do to save time is I'm just going to copy that, paste it in there, and get rid of that last comma and after standard or i'll actually i'll change this back to uh, premium so after that i'll put another comma and then another open quotes double click sales ytd dot country sold to dot ampersand um, double quote so that's the close double quotes on that and then ampersand uk so now we're using two criteria so that is what we pull in back and that is the first criteria and that is the second criteria why it doesn't actually say criteria one criteria two i don't know I found, I found that strange. So there we go. That is, uh, that's revenue from uh, sales where um, type or status, whatever I've called the column, is premium and um, country sold to is UK. And you can, you, know, you can just go on and on and on creating um, multiple criteria. 
So, of course, the, the other way to have done that would have been to have created a measure. So if I go in and create a measure and call that measure revenue for premium and then use the calculate function in DAX and I want to sum the revenue and I want to sum the revenue where I think it's product type. There we go. Product type equals premium. So I'm just doing a, a, a DAX calculate function there. If you're familiar with that, great. If you're not, basically the, the calculate function tells it to generate that figure, but only where there's a criteria that matches that. Do I have I got enough brackets? I think I have. Yeah. So now what I'll do is I'll put equals cube value. Um, and then this workbook data model and measures dot that one there should come to the same figure. Ah, hang on. That one, yeah, that one I changed to standard. So let's change that back to premium. There you go, same value. Okay, you'll feel, feel your four parallel universes behind. Yes, I have that. Uh, I have that feeling sometimes. Um, so yes, um, you've got two ways of doing it. One way of doing it is to create the measure and then just use a basic cube value function. Uh, the other way, uh, sorry, use the basic cube value function. That's that one. Uh, or you can effectively put the criteria in the cube value function. Okay, so I'm I'm always I'm always um, appreciative of the fact, and I've said this earlier that that we do you know we do have a wide range of of, of knowledge um, on these sessions, um, and you know when you see a comment like I'm I feel I'm four parallel universes behind, um, it, it it kind of says to me, Mike, slow down a bit. Um, can you enter the measures into the calculation area in Power Pivot 2? You well, yeah, the way you do that is if you go to Power Pivot Manage, so if you go into the data model, you can actually click into um you have to click into the calculation area. You can't do it up here. So yeah, you can click into the calculation area and you can put something like um, you know, Mike's measure i think you have to put colon equals um and let's put some open brackets let's just say sales ytd revenue and press enter yeah there we go make this column a bit wider so we can see the results of the measures there we go so yes so yeah that's another way of doing it um the reason i don't do it that way one is habit i've always done it through the power pivot uh, menu uh but also i don't think and somebody else might know um if i'm wrong but i don't think you can define the unless you can do it here i don't think you can define the format if you do it from here, maybe you can. Oh, you can. Oh, I didn't know that. Excellent. So, so yes. Um, yeah, it is. It is pretty cool. It is pretty cool, uh, David. Yeah. So create your measures up here. Just remember to put colon equals there. Uh, and then, yeah, you can apply the formatting to it. So, yeah, an alternative way of doing it. As I said, this isn't really a session on measures. I know that um, we've got a, a session in, I think you said January, didn't you, uh, for us, that somebody's doing measures, albeit in Power BI, measures are measures are measures, and DAX is DAX is DAX. You can do it right-click as well. Ah, excellent format. I didn't know that. Yeah, I shall be creating my measures in here from now on. 
<laughs> okay, so um, so we've looked at creating measures, uh, and then we've looked at how you can use those measures with the cube value function. So the, at the very minimum, you know, you just put equals cube value, and then you put in this workbook data model, and then you put in measures dot and the name of the measure. And if you want to get complicated and start using criteria, you can do, or you can put that criteria in as part of the measure. All right. So um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create two more measures because I've been asked to um, put in here um, 1st of January through to whatever date the last order is. So if I just go back and look at the data, um, let's just put this in order. Yes, yeah, the 1st of January, I think it's something like the 16th of May. Yeah, 16th of May. So I need two measures. Okay, so let's click in here. And the first measure... I'm going to call period start. So period start equals min open brackets. So I didn't put the colon. That's why the IntelliSense didn't pop up. So min open brackets sales YTD um, order date close brackets. So what that's doing is that is going to give me the lowest date in that column. I, as I said, I could have created the measure back in Excel, but uh, with my newfound knowledge, I'm going to create it here. So there is, uh, there's another function, I think it's called first date. So there's two similar functions that will generate the, the, the same value. Um, there's the min and there's first date. I did a little bit of research and um, I came across a video from uh, our good friend Albert Ferrari uh, on YouTube and he said use min and if he says use min I will use min um, but what that will do that will give me the the lowest date the earliest date I can also format it uh, so I'll format it as date and I'll just use day month year And there is, of course, another measure um, which I need to create, which I'm going to call period end. I could have had all these measures pre-created, but I thought there's going to be some people who aren't familiar with measures. So I thought I would create them as we go. So period end equals max open brackets sales YTD order date close brackets and enter. And then I will format that. I like that right click where you can format. That's cool. OK, so I have two measures, period start and period end. So I'll close down the data model. And in here, what I will put is equals cube value uh, this workbook data model comma uh, measures dot and it was period start ampersand open quotes space uh, two space close quotes uh, cube value this work or data model comma measures dot period end so what that should give us is it should give us the start date, then space to space, and then give us the end date. Which it doesn't like. What am I missing? Hmm. 
Might have been the ampersand. The ampersand, yeah, I've just spotted that. Okay, so what it's done in good old Excel tradition is it has given us the uh, the serial number of the two dates. But what I can do is I can use the good old text function of Excel to wrap into here, wrap around the text function. So equals text. That is what I want it to convert to text. And then comma, uh, say dd dash y. Um, M M M dash Y Y Y Y ampersand text open brackets. That's what I want it to convert to text, comma D D M M M Y Y Y Y. There we go. Perfect. So that's just using the standard Excel text function, um, which, as I'm sure many of you know, will convert a numeric value into text. So, so it can be used within a string. So that's giving us the 1st of January to the 16th of May. I'm going to save that. And I'm going to go to my um, CSV file, which is where that data came from originally. And I'm going to just change that to the 18th of May. I could have added another row, but it's easier just to make that change. Save it, close it. And then if I do a refresh, data refresh all, that should pull the data back into the data model. Then update the values of those measures. And update to the 18th. There we go. It's updated. OK, how are we doing for questions? I don't see any more. OK, uh, how, how are we here, here? Like, uh, let's say that if somebody would like to uh, format that date in itself in the data model, then uh, maybe he can use the format function, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And that would uh, help him out to get the results. I think it would, yeah. Well, actually, no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't, because I formatted. I okay. formatted those. Yeah, so it's it's still pulling it through as as pure number. Okay. So I still I still had to use. Well, if I'd actually if I'd done this, if I'd done cube value, this workbook data model um, measures dot period start and just left it like that then it comes through formatted as date but it's because i concatenated several things together with the fixed word two so originally it was that plus that plus that and just like if you were doing that in, you know, in normal spreadsheet, it would have converted those um, dates to numeric values. So I still had to use the text function to convert them to a date format within the text string. How long have I got to speak, by the way? Uh, you can continue. Maybe you, you have another 10, 20 minutes. OK, great. Perfect. Right, so I'm going to save this. I'm going to close it down. And I'm going to open up cube value two, I think, cube functions two. Right, this from memory is the same set of data. Yeah, it's the same set of data. It's just a different file. <laughs> and what I want to do here is show the total revenue for a specific country. So to save the user typing the name of the country, I'm going to create a dropdown, which I will eventually do with data validation. Um, the country names are, we know, are in the data model. So we've seen the data model. Um, they're in 
a column called Country Sold To. And I think there's about eight different countries. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the note sheet. I could put this over here. But you know how it is. If you're creating stuff that doesn't actually need to appear on this report, but needs to be in the file, you tend to create it on a, on a separate sheet. So, you know, I could have created it over here, but my preference is just to, to dump it in a different sheet. And for this one, I'm going to use a different cube function. I'm going to use the cube set function. What the cube set function does is it grabs the values from uh, a specified column. So equals cube set, the connection is going to be this workbook data model. And the expression is going to be this. It's going to be not measures this time, but sales YTD dot country sold to dot children. Now, this is a weird one because if you put the dot, children doesn't come up in the IntelliSense. If you actually just left it like that, then it doesn't, well, I was going to say it doesn't return a value, but I will explain what's being returned shortly. Something is being returned. I think it's returning the um, the fact that there is just one column called country sold to because the the result of that, the value of that is a one. I know you can't see the one, but you'll see why in a minute. So, yeah, this is a this is a weird one when it comes to IntelliSense. It's dot and then it's the word children and close double quotes. Children, as the name suggests, is all the individual members of that column. So the column name just refers to the column. Children refers to all the items in that column. OK. Um, I will come back to Abdul's question shortly now that we've moved on to this, uh, this second demo. The cube set function doesn't actually appear to do anything because we've got a blank cell. What it's actually done, as I said, is actually retrieved a list of all the items from the country sold to column in that table. And it's storing them all in that cell invisibly. Now, there's a third parameter of the cube set function. It's optional and it's caption. Now, caption means put some word in and it will appear in the cell. So you can put anything in there. Here's the countries. Or I could put Saudi Arabia, or I could put UK, or I could put Excel is cool. I could put anything in as that third parameter. And basically what it does is it displays that text in the cell. So it's a placeholder. It's just a way so that people know that's not a blank cell, because if there's nothing displayed in that cell, there's a temptation to just go and type into that cell, isn't there? I know you could protect the cell and everything, but you know if you don't, then there's a temptation to, to think it's a, a cell you can type into. So what we're saying is, Go to the data model in this workbook and grab all the values in the country sold to column. Dis store them, not display them, store them in A1, but display that as a kind of placeholder text. So that third parameter is optional, but it is useful. Once I've done that, I'm then going to go to B1 and use yet another cube function, which is cube set count, which you can probably work out what it does. And it tells you there anyway, it returns the number of items in the cube set, the set being the uh, cell that contains the cube set function, which is A1. 
and it's given us a number. So we now know there are eight items in there. So the cube set function grabs the items. The cube set count function counts how many there are. Then in C1, I'm going to use the sequence function to go from one to eight or one to nine or however many items there are in there. Of course, if you're using a version of Excel that doesn't support the dynamic array functions, you could just do this manually. But basically what you want is you want it to generate a list of numbers from one to whatever, where the whatever is that number there, which is the number of items that are in that cube set. And we're going to use those numbers in a minute. And then we're going to use another cube function, which is the cube ranked member function. And what that does is it returns a specific item from the set. So if we had the um, parameter one in the cube ranked member function, it would return the first item. Two would return the second item. Three would return the third item. So you can probably work out what I'm going to do. I'm going to get it to list all the countries down there. And the one in D1 will be the first uh, item from the um, the cubes from the uh, the set. The one in D2 will be the second item, and so on. So it's cube ranked member. This workbook data model. And then if I do A1, because that is the cell that's got the actual cube value, uh, sorry, it's got the actual um, items in it. And that needs to be made absolute. So I can, because I'm going to copy this formula down in a minute. And then if I do C1, but use the hash sign so that it references the entire array. So what this one is doing is it is going to um, grab the items and list them. It's actually going to grab it and put it into D1. There we go. But because D1 is an array, that is the first item, that's the second item, third item, and so on and so on. That one, for some people, is kind of a bit mind-blowing because it's building on different functions. So if we go back to the first function, the cube set function, that is giving us basically a list of items from a particular column. That's the key there. So as I said, we don't need that, but you know, if we don't have that, we end up with a blank cell in, in A1. So that is grabbing all the items and storing them in A1 behind the scenes. That is telling us how many items there are. We only need that to generate that list of numbers. I could have manually just typed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But you know, it's it's a lot more dynamic if we if we use that number with uh, with those and then the cube ranked member function that is grabbing the actual item name and it's based on that cell because that cell's got the cube set in it and that number okay so once i've done that i am going to go back to um uh, no, I'm going to go and create my my um, data validation now from here. So I'm going to go back to here, go to B4 and do data, data validation. Set that to list and set that to be D1, but put the hash sign at the end so that it picks up the array. And there we go, voila. So we can now choose our country from that list. And then 
if you wanted to calculate the total revenue, we can use the cube value function. So back to the first one I showed you, cube value, this workbook data model measures dot, um, ah, I haven't got the measure, have I? I didn't create the measure. Right, let me go and create a measure. So create a new measure, call the measure, total revenue, and then the measure will be sum of the revenue. Okay, so yes, I need a measure before I can reference it. So equals cube value, not that one, equals cube value. This workbook data model um, measures dot, there we go, total revenue. And then we need the criteria. So it will be comma, and then it will be sales YTD dot country sold to dot ampersand. Hang on, I need another, I think I need another open quote there, ampersand B4, ampersand close quotes. Close brackets. And there we go. Oh, yeah, I missed off a double, an extra double quote at the end. I could right align that. And then as I choose different countries, it gives me the total revenue. So what that one is doing is that one is using the Q value function. That's our first parameter, which is telling it which measure to use. And that is our second parameter, which is the criteria. So it's, it's saying basically where country sold to is equal to what's in B4. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I did have another demo. Uh, which involved um, doing a slicer and grabbing the uh, grabbing the values um, for the countries and putting them in a slicer, but that is probably enough for today. I would uh, I would guess I'm just just going off the time and uh, what Faraz said. So I hope that's been useful. David said thank you for a great demo. You're very welcome. Um, Abdul put a question in before, so let me go back to. To that. Uh, that was Q value two, I think. If I remove the two and kept the two dates, was that? No, that was Q value one. Yeah, you can get the files. I will send them through to Faraz. Yeah. I'll share it on the OneDrive and I'll keep it uh, in the video link. It will be there. Okay. So uh, Abdul says, if I remove the two and keep the two dates, well, that's showing date format. So if I actually remove the text bit out of here and remove that, I have a feeling the answer is no, but because you're still, it will it will, Abdul, if you just have one cube value function in. But as soon as you start ampersanding it, um, and even if you just ampersanded the second cube function, I have a feeling if I change that to, say, period end. Yeah, basically what it's now done is it's now, once you start combining things together, it basically says first um, um, date um, serial number and second date serial number. So yeah, you st you you'd still do have to convert it to text. You're okay if you just wanted to store period start and period end in two separate cells, but once you start ampersanding them together, then you're going to have to start using the text function. Rather typical of Excel to do with that with dates. Yes. Dates are a minefield. 
All right. So, uh, yeah, I hope that has been useful. Um, what I'm going to do, I always stick uh, my email address up at the end of these sessions, just in case anybody does want to uh, to contact me directly. Uh, so, yeah, there's my email address. Uh, but as far as the files are concerned, yeah, I'm uh, I'm happy to uh, send them through to Faraz and then he can uh, can make them available. So I will hand back to you, Faraz, uh, for sort of general chat and any more questions that might come in. Uh, so I'll make sure that my, my mic is unmuted. <laughs> okay, so that is really lovely, Mike, you know, and uh, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And um, uh, in fact, you know, that uh, there was a question on YouTube, you know, somebody asked about the slicer that how can you, is it possible to do something with the slicers? So I would say that we have to invite Mike again now because we are running out of time. We want to go and watch some FIFA matches also. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can show I can show the slicer if if you know it'll only take me a few minutes if you want me to. Okay, great. If if it's yeah. okay, Mike, uh, please. Yeah, but, uh, I'm still. You will be very happy. Yeah, I'm still sharing my screen, aren't I? Right. Yeah, it's Q function three. But that's a bonus one coming up. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, normally you connect your slices to pivot tables or tables, but I don't have a pivot table here. And the, obviously I don't have a table because the data is in the data model. So if I just go to insert and slicer, to a slicer. Can't see it looking. There it is. So if I do insert slicer and I click the data model and I choose tables in the data model and click open, and then I select country and click OK. There is my slicer. So it's just it's just a normal slicer. You can do all the normal things with it, change the colors, change the layout, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um so I can put, you know, I can put my slicer over here. Now, if you go up to the slicer menu and you go to slicer settings, you've got this thing here called name to use in formulas. And it's always slicer underscore and then the column name from the table. So slicer underscore country sold to. So if I go to, and what I'll do is I'll do this stuff over here again, you know, in the real world, I'd have done it on the note sheet, but so you can see everything on the one sheet, I'll do it over here. So if I do equals cube set, which is what we covered before, this workbook data model, comma, where it's getting its values from is slicer, underscore country sold to and then we have this um now for some reason that doesn't go in quotes um but what does need to go in quotes is that placeholder text that optional third parameter okay so I'm just displaying the word countries in there, but what's actually stored in M1 is the names of the countries, which it's actually picked up from the slicer rather than picking up from the column in the, uh, in the table. But actually either would do if you think about it. So I could have done it by picking it up from the column in the table, just like the last example, because these, are the values that are coming from the column in the table. Then what I need to do is I need to display the selected country. So over in B4, I'll put equals cube ranked member. Hang on a minute. Yeah, equals cube ranked member this workbook data model and then comma and m1 comma one so cube ranked member 
is what we used before to see the list of all the items in the cube set. In this case, the cube set is the values in the slicer. The one, when, okay, let's take this, let's take this uh, back a step. I just said that to get the list of countries stored in the cube set, I could either get them from the slicer or I could do what I did last time. I could get them from the column in the table. But actually, I in this example, I've got to get them from the slicer because I want this to show me which items have been selected. So you can see that as I click on a slicer item, what it's doing, it's actually storing in that cell. I think my Excel has crashed. What it's doing is it's actually storing in that cell the value of the selected slicer, and then it's pulling it through to there. So the one refers to the first item. Yes, my Excel has crashed. The one refers to the first item in the cube set. So the cube set in this case is only the items that are selected. If all the items are selected, then what it does is it shows the word all there. So yeah, basically that is how to do it. Add a slicer onto the spreadsheet. As I said, Excel seems to have crashed on me here. So quite happy to just do this bit again. I also see a couple of questions which I will answer in a minute. Okay, so yeah, add a slicer, insert slicer. Go to data model, select that, click open, choose the field. There's my slicer. And then over here, use equals cube set with this data model. Then the name of the slicer. And remember, we don't have to put anything as that third parameter. So in this case, I won't. What have I missed out here? Why is that showing us? You put it in quotes. That's the reason. I'll put it in quotes, yeah. And I told you it didn't go in quotes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there we go. So, yeah, so what it's storing, what it's storing in there is it's storing the word China invisibly. It's now storing the word Germany. It's now storing the word Mexico. It's now storing the word all. So the cube set, when you are using a slicer, as the expression, it's actually storing only the selected item. And then what I did here was used cube ranked member. Uh, this workbook data model. Um, that was it, that cell there, L1. That's why it's a good idea to actually um, put something in the cell so you know which one it is and one. And the reason it's one is because you only want it to pick the first item. Maybe it wasn't L1. It was K1. It was K1. There we go. So yes, that is how to do it with a slicer. Okay, infamous Excel crash. Yes, it wouldn't be Excel without one, would it? Okay, Ismail says, my understanding is before you start with the cube functions, you need to create a pivot table. No, you don't. You don't need a pivot table in the file. Okay, so basically cube functions would replace the need for the pivot table. Because if you think about what I did, is this crashed again? This is what I was saying to you before uh, for us that it seems to crash on me, but only when I'm running parallels on the Mac. So uh, I might have to uh, to look at getting an M1 Mac. 
Yeah, I'm definitely going to try that one at my end as well, trying to create the slides and give you the feedback. But uh, when you have you give demos, you know, you it, it happens, you know, it happens because you learn, run with a lot of resources, like right now using Zoom and you have panels. So it's very common, you know, that uh, yeah. you hit up with this uh, crashing of any application. Okay, Curtis says, can you do a multi-select in the slicer and get multiple members back from the set? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, I'm not going to try it because I, um, I, I'll probably crash it again. But you can. What you, what you have to do is you have to basically do the sequence thing that I showed you in the previous demo to get the list of numbers. And then you generate... Um, another cube ranked member function, which generates the list of countries that have been selected. And then for the actual country, what I ended up doing is I ended up doing a, a text join. So over here, I would have had like one, two, three, four, five, etc. And then over here, I would have had like China and uh, and say Saudi and say Japan, that would have been the ones that were selected. And then over here, I would have used a text join function to join all of those values there with a parameter of true so that it ignores the blank cells. Does the use of cube functions chew up a lot of resources? I don't think it does. I don't think it does, no. Um, from what I've read, it, um, it probably doesn't use as much resources as, as you know, big, uh, hulky uh, pivot tables. So, yes, Curtis, that uh, that is uh, how you can uh, select multiple items. Um, is Q functions an alternative to pivot tables? Yes, it is. Um, that's where a lot of people use them. I mean, yes, if you think about the first example that I did. I actually had a pivot table. So I've got a pivot table here, which is connected to the data model. And then originally what I was doing is I was getting these values for my report by just referencing these cells here. So yeah, it is. It's treated by a lot of people as an alternative to pivot tables. And it's much more flexible. It's much more flexible than pivot tables. Um, there was another question as well from Nabil. Is there a way to generate the drop down menu directly from the cube set without using the cube sequence and the cube rank member? I don't think there is. Um, if there is, it's not something I've come across, but that's now intrigued me. Um, I'm not going to try it today, but um, and there might be a way of doing it, but it's not something I've come across. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. All right, I will pass Great. it back to you for us. Thank you, Mike, thank you very much uh, for this lovely session talking about Q functions and uh, showing us some amazing way that how can you use the dynamic arrays and put it into with the Q, uh, Q functions. And uh, this is a place where I, I personally have, uh, I, I'm, I was afraid to touch, uh, but now I, I used to just use it just for my work purpose but now you know the way you explain how things works it, it was really simple and um, you somewhat let me fall in love with your functions now so um, I, uh, but we are just going to sign out now from uh, from the YouTube live but we'll be still on Zoom sometime uh, maybe for uh, the parties after, uh, after the the streaming is ended on the uh, on the live uh, so my friends, just stay back. And um, as usual, I always ask my speakers, you know, that if they have any last words to say anything, whatever you like, Mike, you know, uh, anything you would like to say. No. Um, well, uh, any last only... thoughts, any, any quotes from Satya Nalade or, or something no. very special from Mike, you know, we can always remember that. The only way you can contact me, uh, the xltrainer.co.uk. So um, why isn't that coming up? Maybe I've got no internet 
connection on this uh, virtual machine. Um, so if I go and run this on Windows. There we I go. He makes a lot of videos also on uh, on uh, Mac as well. So he, if you are a Mac user, then if you're looking for some videos, do visit uh, my channel also because he does make a lot of videos on Mac related issues as well. Yeah, there we go. So the exceltrainer.co.uk is my uh, website. And um, from there, you can get to my YouTube channel. And yeah, I've done uh, I've done a fair few videos recently on uh, on Mac stuff, Excel for Mac. So yeah, I hope that's been useful. I hope it's helped you uh, learn a little bit more about Excel. As we always say, every day is a school day with Excel. <laughs> yeah, that was lovely. And I learned I learned one or two things along the way today as well, particularly with formatting uh, formatting um, uh, the the um, the meshes from the uh, the data model window. Wow. Thank you, Mike. And bye, my friends. But stay live back on Zoom. Uh, and we are ending live from YouTube Live. Bye, my friends. And see you in the next meetup, which is going to be next year. And I'll wish you a happy new year and a Merry Christmas to everybody. Those are here. Thank you. Bye.